Hi, my name is Daisha Donner and I'm the director of Apple Blossom Community School. We're located at the Rail River Folk School here in Bemidji and we are growing into a very small nonprofit private school for pre-k through third grade. Before I opened the school I had lots of years of child care experience both in center-based care and I then I opened my own group family child care. I'm happy to be here today through Peacemakers Resources to share some ideas and tips that I have learned over the years. And I have also had Waldorf teacher training since 2011. I've spent summers in Portland, Oregon, uh, learning about the Waldorf education methods. And so that also heavily influences the work that I do with young children today. I would like to mention a couple of things about the importance of play in this video and I was just doing some reading and research and Wired Magazine was listing the five most important toys that young children need and I am very happy to say that they are very budget friendly and anybody can provide these things to young kids. And the, the more open-ended type toys that we can give kids, the better to let them problem solve and be creative. And so the top toys that Wired Magazine recommends are boxes, sticks, dirt, cardboard tubes, and string or yarn. So those are all very open-ended and budget-friendly and, uh, and those items really promote that imaginative and creative play that's just so important for young children. I also wanted to touch on providing a warm and nurturing atmosphere for young children and the more of a home-like feel that we can give those early childhood settings, the better. So if you're already doing home daycare, you are already probably doing many of these things, but just to keep in mind that in the spaces that you provide childcare in, um, to keep that warm, home-like feel of, um, you know, a couple of lamps and a wooden table and natural lighting and the plants and keeping some spaces open on the walls and think about um, maybe putting up a painting, landscapes, or flowers, calming images for the children to look at. Then I, I wanted to talk today about infant and toddler care because my previous videos have been pretty heavily focused on the preschool age and there hopefully were um, good ideas and some nuggets of information that can be used for older toddlers and even to keep in mind as infants are growing into toddlers and toddlers growing into preschool. But I wanted to talk more specifically about infant toddler care today. And I wanted to mention the RIE or RIE ap approach that was developed by Magda Gerber. And back when I worked at Campus Child Care Center at BSU, the infant teacher and I went to a training and that's where we discovered the RIE or RIE approach to infant and toddler care. And we just intuitively felt like this was a great way to care for babies and toddlers. And so we brought back many of the ideas from that training and I just wanted to share a few of them with you today. So Magda Gerber's RIE philosophy is based out of respect for and trust in the baby to be an initiator and an explorer and a self-learner. So she recommends that babies develop from the ground up and the more research that is being done about movement and physical development, the more that this philosophy makes sense. So we brought back the idea to our childcare center that we wanted to get rid of the containers. And maybe you've heard that term before of um, putting babies in containers. And that's just uh, referring to all the 
car seats, the infant seats, the swings, the bouncy seats, all those containers that we put babies in and we prop them up and we try to help them into their next phase of development, whether that's sitting up or whether that's walking. And the RIE approach, the RIE approach is um, just letting us know that babies will develop at their own pace and the more freedom they have to do that, the better. So setting up a safe place for babies to be free to move and explore and just lay on the ground and develop that freedom of movement right from the ground up is so important. We've all heard of tummy time, but it's more than just tummy time. It's, uh, it's that freedom of mobility for them to turn their head and raise their arms up and down and be able to turn their bodies. Um, and sometimes that mobility is stopped by the containers that we put them in. So keeping that in mind. And then also, we also started to use baby carriers um, at which they are, they are contained in a baby carrier, but they're still having to use some strength of their own muscles and their own neck. Um, of course, they need the support and you want to follow licensing rules for all of this, but um, they, can, they can still develop their muscles and some of those, the freedom of movement that, that they can't always do in the infant seats. So we got rid of the majority of our bouncy seats and swings. We did keep maybe a swing for a, a very small baby if we really needed a safe place to put the baby. And we kept our high chairs, of course, and their cribs. But then we also set up an area that was blocked off from the more mobile infants and toddlers to keep them safe and let the babies just lay on the floor and develop that way. So I wanted to mention that and how important that is. And then another part of the philosophy is just that respect for infants and toddlers and letting them know what you're doing and what is coming next and using diapering and potty training as connection times and learning times. It's a great opportunity to make a connection one-on-one -on -one with the child and to sing a song or do a finger play maybe teach them um, about body parts, head, shoulders, hands, um, just all the different learning that can go on in those moments. And setting up a safe environment for them to move and explore as they become mobile. And rather than trying to teach them new skills, we stand back a bit and we observe what they're doing and we use encouragement for what they are already doing. We acknowledge what they're doing and we encourage them towards the next milestone, but we don't um, so much physically try to teach them a new skill. We trust that they will learn a new skill. And you do need to keep an eye on the developmental milestones and all babies are different, but they develop those skills within a range of time. So you want to keep an eye on that, but then standing back just a little bit to observe and trust what that baby is doing is a good thing. And it's so important for that freedom of movement as babies because the reflexes that they have as babies and that they, um, they go through all the different steps of um, crawling and walking and the, the moving of their heads um, is, is really important and it might not show up at the time of how important it is, but it is actually related to academic success later on. If you think about a first grader that is slumping on their desk and they just ha they have to prop their head up with their hand, the core strength and the posture, thinking about all those things and how important it is to allow babies and toddlers and preschoolers and kindergartners that time to develop and move and be physically active and develop, develop at their own pace is so important. I wanted to talk 
a little about child guidance and give some tips and ideas from my Waldorf background and just my own experiences working with groups of children for many, many years. And sharing is a big one that comes up, sharing and taking turns. And we don't force sharing. So we might encourage them to share, but we also want them to know that they can't just grab something and, and take it from another child, that they need to be able to learn that skill of delayed gratification and that they can wait. So we encourage the child who wants something to ask. And of course we have to do a lot of modeling when they're toddlers, but hopefully by the time they're a preschooler, they can say, could I please use that toy when you're done? And the other child who has the toy, hearing that they can have the toy until they are done, will often just give the toy to the other child. Not always, but often that's the case. Um, whereas when they see a child just, you know, pleading or trying to grab, then they become more attached and want to keep it and not share. So rather than telling them, you need to share, we want to help the child who's asking to use the appropriate language to get what they want or need, but that they may have to wait and encourage them to find something else to do while they're waiting. And then the child who is being asked, um, we may need to encourage in a little bit that they give the toy up. Or sometimes if they really seem drawn to a toy or an activity, they may need to have that toy or activity for a while. And so just reminding them that at the next playtime, that it's the other child's turn can often work. We want to teach perseverance and we can do that by offering tasks and projects that might not get done right in that moment. They might take a little bit more time, a little bit more effort. And we want to encourage the child to stay with a task this is getting a little bit more into the preschool or later preschool years. You can start in little steps with older toddlers, of course, but by preschool, we want to start offering some projects and tasks that might take a little bit of time. For example, uh, we made fishing poles one year with preschoolers ages three and a half to five. And I would say we had more success with the five-year-old sticking with it, but it was good for the four-year-olds to try and, and we would help them as needed, but they got to choose a stick and then peel it with a potato peeler and then they sanded it and then we added the yarn or the string. And this took us over the period of maybe two to three days um, because we would just do it for a little bit in the morning playtime and then put them away and then the next day we pull them out again and so when they saw the completed project and that it was time to go play with their pretend fishing poles they were they felt pride and they knew that they had persevered teaching resilience through outdoor play in all kinds of weather at apple blossom we offer outdoor immersion in the fall and the spring so the first two months of the school year, we're outside all day, every day with a yurt as a rain shelter. And the kids learn to deal with, you know, getting rained on or having damp socks for a little bit. Of course, we have to be careful and monitor that every child is warm enough, that they have the correct gear, the correct layers on, that we go into the yurt and warm up or change out of clothes as needed, but they learn so much by getting outside in all kinds of weather. And we take them outside in the winter too. So we move into the building in the winter, but then we still get outside for an hour a day, at least, sometimes more, depending on the weather. And just having them experience all those kinds of weather can build that resilience in young children. Tinker Garden is another great resource for outdoor play ideas and they have a very similar feel and philosophy to what we're doing at Apple Blossom in their outdoor programming. 
empathy. I wanted to talk about empathy and how that develops in young children. And it starts with the role modeling and making sure to meet children's needs while still maintaining gentle boundaries and limits. So if the child feels good and feels good about themselves, they will want to give and they will develop that sense of caring. This takes time and lots of play-based experiences for them to build up the capacity to feel that empathy towards other children and other adults. And if you rush it or push it, it can sometimes backfire and the child might act out or do the opposite of what you wanted them to do or, or to feel. And so saying things like, don't you care about your friends is not helpful to a toddler or a preschooler who is struggling to get their own needs met in the moment. It's better to put it in a positive light and say something like, I know that you care about your friends and that you will share when you're ready. And just shedding that positive light on it and we might have to follow up with the child and help them make the right choices but often they will begin to make more and more of those good choices on their own if they feel good about themselves and feel like their own needs are getting met. And Peacemakers Resources has many resources on developing those social emotional skills in young children. It's just important to remember that it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, some kids, these skills will develop quicker. Every child is different but that we just need to provide that environment of nurturing and care and make sure that their needs are being met and lots and lots of time to play and be with their peers and be with you will help them develop those social emotional skills. I also wanted to mention storytelling. And you can use storytelling as a tool or it can just be for fun. It's also great pre-literacy skill building. Oral storytelling helps children create pictures in their minds, which is so helpful later on for teaching reading. Storytelling can happen anywhere and it can be as simple as describing what you saw outside on your morning walk or what your dog did the night before. You can use found objects such as little toys or nature items to use as props for storytelling. And you'll see me model using some found items in some of my storytelling videos. I have some homemade puppets that I use too, but um, I also just go around and find little toys or things that work for the characters in a story. And nature items outside can be really fun to spread a picnic blanket and look around and see what you can find and bring it to the blanket and then tell a story using what you found. A pine cone could be a hedgehog or a porcupine easily. A stick can be anything. Um, just look around you and see what you can find and be creative with it. It's really fun and the kids enjoy it. Your own hands can be puppets too. I modeled that in the Mr. Wiggles and Mr. Waggles storytelling time. And storytelling can also be used to teach social emotional skills. You can create a story about a little squirrel who wouldn't share his acorns. And then at the end of the story, you share the lesson that the squirrel learned and the kids can take it in on a little different level that way it, without the finger being pointed at right at them and we, there's also lots of books that are like this too that that use a story in the book to to model pro-social behavior in young children teeth are not for biting um, a book for toddlers is one that's really common and there's there's many many Storytelling can also be used in times of trouble, such as now, with COVID-19 on everyone's minds and it's seeping down to the youngest children. We can use storytelling to help children understand, such as a story like The Little Gnome Who Had to Stay Home, or a puppet show that you create 
that helps kids understand what's going on, but in a way that their brain can process the information while still holding them with some security and warmth so that they are not feeling afraid. And storytelling can help make that bridge to what is happening in real life and giving it to kids in a way that they can process it, understand it without feeling the anxiety or the stress that the adults might be feeling. There's many more experienced storytellers than myself. Suzanne Downs offers classes on storytelling and puppetry and she has resources online on her website. Susan Perro wrote The Little Gnome Who Had to Stay Home and it will be included in a collection of protection stories for young children that she's writing. And her book, Healing Stories for Children, is an excellent resource. Kim Alsop is also writing a protection story for children just for these times. And Little Round Schoolhouse and Amy's Daisies are two Waldorf programs that offer story times online. So you can see what Waldorf storytelling and puppetry looks like. Other than me, like I said, there's lots of uh, more experienced storytellers than myself. I want to just end by thanking you again for all the good work that you do with our youngest children. It's rewarding work, but it can be very challenging work, and it is the most important work. And as research is showing us that young children's brains develop the fastest in these early years, it's becoming more recognized that working with young children is so important. So you are helping lay the foundation for future academic success and for children to become lifelong learners and live happy and healthy lives. I'll be sending out more tips by email and you can reach me by email if you have any questions or wanna discuss anything further. Peacemakers Resources has all my contact information. Thanks again for watching my videos.